Welcome to episode 196 of Your Career Podcast. If you're interested in engineering, then this episode is perfect for you as I interview two impressive young ladies who are making their mark in aerodynamic engineering. But before we begin, if your job has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and you need support, please visit the Careers Academy online and download many of my free career support resources. They'll help you to get back on your feet. Visit www.thecareersacademy.online. The link is in my show notes as I want to be sure that you have the support you need. Hannah Stevens and Taylor Perko are two impressive young ladies who co-host The Blonde Blueprint, a podcast focused on increasing diversity in engineering through fun, informal conversations. These two young female engineers are figuring out the industry as they go, and I was lucky enough to be invited on their podcast. While speaking with them, I realized what great guests they would be on your career podcast, as these aerodynamics and astronautics engineers as graduates will surely inspire all women in STEM around the world. Here's a quick introduction before we begin our interview. Now, growing up, Hannah Stevens was always fascinated by planes, rockets, and space. Hannah is an aerodynamics engineer at Boeing. Her passion, mixed with a strong desire to succeed in things that are deemed difficult or impossible, brought her to aerospace engineering, where she can not only blaze new trails for women and other underrepresented groups in the industry, but also build rockets that take us to new worlds or design planes that seem to defy physics. Her leadership style is focused around change. How can processes be improved or how can we create better solutions for ourselves or our customers. This mentality helps her thrive in her role as an aerodynamics engineer in flight sciences and product development. And Taylor Perko is an aeronautics and astronautics engineer majoring at the University of Washington. She's passionate about space and space technology. Currently, Taylor is at the NASA Johnson Space Center co-op program, working in various divisions within mission control, including the environmental and thermal operations pathways intern in the space flight systems division, trajectory operations pathways intern in the flight dynamics division, and robotic operations pathways intern in the EVA robotics and crew systems division. And let's welcome Taylor and Hannah to the show. Hello, ladies. Hi. Hello, thanks hello. for having us. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. I am so impressed with both of you, female engineers. One, Taylor, is a flight controller at the Johnson Space Center, and Hannah is the aerodynamics engineer at Boeing. I'm just fascinated to find out how you both got into engineering, but just to kick us off, as I always do in my podcasts, can you tell me what were your early career aspirations when you were little? Let's go Hannah first. Yeah, okay. So I think I always wanted to do something in STEM, something in science, something that would sound cool on a piece of paper, right? Like you said, a sexy title. Um, <laughs> maybe not with like that adjective as a kid, but I wanted to be like, oh, you did that as a lady? That's cool. <laughs> um, and I think I saw, you know, I transitioned from like wanting to be a doctor, an anesthesiologist. And then as I took more like chemistry classes, I realized I didn't like that. And I started to get really into physics. And I saw a movie, um, have, I don't know if you guys have seen it, called Top Gun. Mm. Uh, it's like an old mm. Tom Cruise movie from the 80s. And there's a character in that movie named Charlie. And she's, you know, this aerodynamicist. She's an astrophysics uh, contractor for, you know, the Navy with Tom Cruise. And she kind of shows off all of her knowledge and kind of shows him up and tells him his place. And she knows more than him. And I thought that is so cool. I love planes and I want to like feel confident in my knowledge and be able to work on projects that are really amazing. And so I found my way to aerospace engineering. 
Wow, fascinating. You know, Top Gun has influenced so many people. I've had, <laughs> I've had a few other guests on the podcast who've talked about Top Gun as well. But you know, I watched Top Gun when it first came out, <laughs> way back in the 80s. <laughs> and it was fantastic. It was really oh, a, a great, great inspirational film. So I can, I can see how that inspired you. And what about you, Taylor? What were your early career aspirations? Yeah, I I think the first thing I ever wanted to be was a singer, but um, I really, I also kind of knew I had an affinity for science, and I used to watch uh, these um, things on the Discovery Channel. It was Nova, and I remember one of the ones I watched was from an astrophysicist, and he was talking about like multiple universes and quantum mechanics and all these crazy things that like to a little girl was like, oh my gosh, it's like magic. Like, I can't believe that people <laughs> understand this and know how it works. And I wanted to be an astrophysicist from that point on. Um, I never thought I would go into engineering. My dad and all of his brothers were all engineers. And I think the fact that it was kind of like a big family thing, I was like, I'm going to do anything but engineering. But then kind of as time went along, I knew I wanted something more hands-on than what astrophysics could offer me, but I still wanted to have that, you know, wonder and excitement in my job. So I definitely wanted to stick with the space industry, which is how it led me to aerospace engineering. Oh, fascinating. And, and it's just, it's such an interesting industry, isn't it? Because there's so much to learn and you have to really keep up to speed and on top of <laughs> all of the latest developments all the time. But you know, traditionally, this is not a career journey that many, and I hate to say this, but that many women follow. It yeah. seems to be more of a male dominated industry. So, mm -hmm. so when you made your career decisions or your subject decisions, and you decided to go to university and pursue this side of uh, your career, um, did you did you find any challenges? You know, when you were you know being accepted into university, or did you have to somehow prove yourself? Yes. Yeah. I. I, I <laughs> you want yeah, to start? Uh, go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, I think the problem with women in a lot of STEM fields, it's, you know, it's kind of the pipeline. You're kind of, in a lot of ways, you're pushed towards more people-friendly roles. You're kind of, you know, you're encouraged to take more of like a nurturing position, doing things like uh, nursing or things like that. And I think, um, I think, you know, it, it takes you know, determination and kind of knowing what you want to do from an earlier age to not give in to some of those peer pressures. Um, but I think we in university, up until university, I, I didn't really experience any like direct adversity from people regarding like being a woman in engineering. But I think in university, we both, uh, both Hannah and I worked at a wind tunnel, which is uh, an aeronautics laboratory. And we met with basically the wind tunnel worked with a lot of commercial companies that, you know, had a lot of older male engineers that kind of fit, you know, the stereotypical role. And I think some of those encounters definitely kind of, you know, solidified the stereotype. And mm. there was a lot of, um, you know, oh, honey, you don't need to pick up that heavy piece of machinery or <laughs> it's okay. You don't have to use the torque wrench. I'll get one of the big strong boys to do it. And there's kind of, you know, some things like that. Mm -hmm. And and that actually, it, it's quite demeaning when people say things like that. Oh, it, yeah. they, they think yeah. they're being nice or maybe sometimes <laughs> yeah. people don't even realize what they're saying, but it does make you feel like, oh no, I can, I can actually do this myself. And what about mm -hmm. you, Hannah? Did you, did you find that there was a bit of a challenge? Yeah, I think that I, you know, growing up, I've always been a competitive person. And so sometimes when those challenges would come up, I'm like, oh, you think that I can't do it. Well, now I'm going to do it better than you thought I could. Um, and so, you know, I, like Taylor said, we experienced a lot of that at the wind tunnel, but I think that also in classes too, there were times where, you know, professors would, wouldn't give us as good of grades or wouldn't call on us as much or interact mm -hmm. with us as much because we were women. And most of our professors were males. I think sometimes that even, you know, and, and like you said, they don't know that they're doing it, but that's kind of like where our podcast came in, where we're trying to illuminate that and like show that other women that, Hey, this is happening and it doesn't need to be. So like, it's not just the norm. It's something that we can actively um, address and fix. And so mm -hmm. I think that happened in classes too, where, you know, students see that like the professors are treating, you know, female students this way. And then they, 
you know, subconsciously do the same thing. Yeah. And you'll get into like a lab group where, you know, you're the only girl in the lab group and you all have to be working together, but then they don't even talk to you when it comes to like solving a problem. They talk yeah. in between each other. Or they expect you, to, like, you to organize everything. And yeah. Like, like you become like the, the secretary of the group yeah. versus an actual engineer here to solve problems. So that is something that we've both experienced. I think that that's why there are fewer women because, you know, a lot of, and a lot of women wouldn't want to, not women, but I think a lot of people in general mm -hmm. wouldn't necessarily go towards such a, um, a challenging work environment. Like if they had an option, would you choose something that gave you, like made you irritated and made you want to go home and vent about what this person said to you at work? Or would you choose like a nicer career where you're like helping humanity? Um, and not that I think that Taylor and I feel like we don't want to be doing that other stuff but i think that we have like a unique part of our personalities where we do feel like we can challenge that and so now we're trying to show other women that like it's not as much of a challenge and you have the support group to be able to yeah be you have a community of other women who understand what you're going through and want to you know also get rid of this weird adversity that we face and you know it's so unnecessary isn't it because honestly mm -hmm. it's merit you know, on its own own basis and its worth. And so you study hard, you, you get your good grades, you get your degree, you're highly qualified, you're equally qualified, you know, male or female. And then it should be the best person who can do the job gets the job. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and also, I think that both of you will have demonstrated, you know, a true strength of character to get past the, the stigma or the stereotypes of being in this particular industry. So you can really be so, so proud of yourselves that you've done this because now working at the Johnson Space Center and working at Boeing, it's such a great achievement. And I think that's inspiring to every person, not just male or female, but every person, you know, that if you want to get into engineering, it can be done. But for women, there's just that little bit of a challenge because of the perceptions, right? Yeah. 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 And I think we, we've talked about how that extra challenge, that extra adversity that women go through, it usually leads to a lot like you said, more stronger, more confident engineers. And so that's why when you see these engineering projects, it's usually females that have these like leadership positions because mm -hmm. they have gained that extra like skill set yeah. in having to overcome these certain uh, obstacles and yeah. then they are better engineers for it. So, I mean, sometimes it's a bummer that we have to experience it, but I think that there's always a bright side and you can take that experience that you've gained and use it to your advantage. Mm -hmm. And now what about your areas of expertise? Okay, because now you've graduated and you have started working and you're in your careers. So you're, you're poised for a great trajectory in your career. And then of course, coronavirus has, has hit the world and you know, mm -hmm. that's affecting all sorts of things. However, having the skill sets behind you, having the qualifications put you both in a very strong position to continue your career trajectory. So, so let me ask each of you now, your areas of specialization, what do you specialize in, Hannah? I think I've realized as I've started working and looking back at all of the projects that I did in university and in high school even, um, one of my specialties is changing uh, the, the workflow or improving processes. And so, you know, I've you know, recently discovered that I'm a change leader. And I always thought that I just had, I, I, I was just like a particular person that always got irritated at things not working. And I thought, well, maybe that's one of my flaws. But then I realized that, oh, that's actually a skill that I have where I'm able to pinpoint the things that aren't working correctly. And I'm able to absorb absorb feedback from my coworkers and my peers and make a solution that's like unique to the situation and can really improve everyone's uh, happiness and uh, ability to do their work. And I think that's something that I really appreciate doing. So, I mean, I get to do that with a lot of product development. So like Taylor mentioned at the wind tunnel, um, usually the, the products that we were testing were things that the world hasn't seen yet. You know, they're secret to that company and in the industry. Um, and so that was kind of like my little flavor of new and improvements and innovation was through the wind tunnel. And then as I've gone into Boeing, I work in product development. So we're developing planes that are 10, 15 years from now that the community and the public will be flying on. Um, and then within that itself, 
the products I'm making are innovative, but then also the tools that we use to create those projects is like really where I get uh, a lot of my fulfillment is creating new ways to do it and making life, everyone's life easier. I like to be that person that can like, oh, thank you so much for doing that. You lifted a burden off my back. <laughs> and that's such a valuable skill, being able to identify problems or identify a wasteful or inefficient procedure and be able to improve it and improve it because continual process improvement is what, what we need to be an efficient business or efficient society, isn't it? And, and so with the product development, it sounds absolutely fascinating what you're working on and how exciting to be really on the cutting edge of this technology and methodologies and, and knowing what will be released into the world in the future I, I can see the appeal of, mm -hmm. of this job as well it's it's I guess it's not so much of a job it's more like a um, a calling for you isn't it yeah. Yeah? yeah yeah it's really something that you know growing up I didn't even know I wanted to be an engineer I didn't know what engineering was and I never thought that I would be able to be in a position like this but then like the more that you get into it and you network and you work on projects you realize oh I'm not that far off from the type of person that can do this and mm. lo and behold I found myself in the position so it's really exciting yeah oh well well done it sounds great and what about you Taylor so uh, my specialty is that I'm a flight controller at NASA so basically what that entails is your operating uh, the International Space Station and you'll also be operating any future vehicles or missions that happen so you kind of get to see you know the entire you know the life of the mission you get to you know operate robots in space and talk to astronauts and you know solve problems as they come up and um, a lot of it is really communications based um, I think you know when I was going through school, even all the way through university, I was always kind of worried that maybe I'd, you know, made a big mistake by doing engineering because I, you know, the people aspect of engineering was so much, you know, so much more of what I liked and less of, you know, the, the nuts and bolts and torque wrenches and stuff like that. But I think becoming a flight controller, it, it put all of those people aspects into my job. I get, I mean, the main thing that I do is I communicate with people. I get to solve problems and I get to, you know, teach, I get to train people who are coming in. I get to, you know, mentor interns and do all of those things. And it's kind of, you know, it takes the, all the soft skills type of stuff that I was missing in school that I thought I wouldn't have as part of my job. And it, it, you know, now it became my job. You have to have, you know, a technical background to be a flight controller. But even though I'm an engineer, I don't do a lot of, you know, the, the engineering type, you know, design work type of things that like Hannah does. It's a lot more, um, you know, operations, you're talking to people, you're solving problems, you're pushing buttons, you're sending commands. Mm. And, and I think yeah. it's so important to have the strong communication skills in all professions, but mm. in this one in particular, because traditionally people think, oh, engineers don't communicate very well. And so maybe some don't, you know, but there are many communi uh, excellent communicators who are engineers as well. But if you're like the conduit between the two, the technology, and let me explain this to you so that, you know, you understand on a human level, that's a valuable um, skill and trait to have as well and mm -hmm. you know, it, it comes across in the way that you speak is you know how much you care uh, to, to ensure that people do understand what needs to be done and how it can help them and bringing together a cohesive team so that you can actually create even more um, incredible uh, products as well and get get the job done but how mm -hmm. interesting ro ro robots in space you know what was interesting is that yesterday i saw a bbc um, well, uh, what was it? Channel Four um, video of a robot that's really changing life for those with disabilities, and I'm fascinated by robotics, and I'm sure that you would be as well. But mm -hmm. there was um, a, a gentleman who was bedbound with a disability who could not get out of bed, but he was leading a team of staff in a restaurant through this robot. So he was able to use um, the, I, I don't know the true terminology, but using his eyes, he could control mm -hmm. this robot from afar and actually get it to serve tea and coffee to people in a restaurant. And it's giving him a job and it's bringing the humanity into technology, which I was mm -hmm. really amazed at and I'm sure that both of you are working on the cutting edge of technology with the work that you do too so what what do you think both of you where would you like your career to progress to say in the next five to ten years where do you see yourself Hannah 
I see myself in the future uh, being the chief engineer of a program. Uh, what that program is, I'm not sure yet. Um, I definitely, you know, in my time in university and the research projects and labs that I was a part of, I definitely worked on creating a diverse portfolio. So I've worked on space. I, you know, built a 15 foot hybrid rocket with my capstone team. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked on commercial aircraft, which is what I'm doing in my group right now, but I've also worked on defense aircraft. So I worked on Boeing's F-15 program. And so I have like a plethora of experience. Now I, ha I get to have a chance to like look back and decide, well, where do I want to take my technical leadership and my ability to like, uh, make things more seamless and take that into creating a program and an airplane that like comes into the world or maybe that's a spaceship that no one uh, expected before so i'm really excited for that and i hope that you know i am in some sort of leadership position where i'm you know defining the requirements and making sure that we're hitting all the dates uh, when they need to be oh that's that's such a great aspiration chief engineer i can see it <laughs> hannah i can see it <laughs> and what about you taylor where do you see yourself I would really love to one day be a flight director. Um, I think I mean, people, you know, people know flight directors from like, you know, the movie Apollo 13. You see Gene Kranz, he's the one with the, the white vest on and he's the one directing Sweating the whole bit. mission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot of stuff that went wrong in that movie. So. <laughs> but yeah, I think being in charge of an entire mission like that, you know, running the show, essentially, I think that's something that I'd really love to do, kind of being in that position where you're calling the shots, everyone's coming to you, you understand a little bit of what everybody is doing. You kind of get to, you know, you, you oversee the whole thing. You get to be a part of all of it. I'd really love to do that. Mm. And you know what? You, you really display leadership skills because you communicate so beautifully as well. In fact, both of you communicate so well and your passion for your profession comes through so strongly. And it's so strong that you both have your own podcast. So you mentioned it uh, earlier, Hannah. It, you know, tell us the name of the podcast and what it's for. Yeah, so our podcast is called The Blonde Blueprint to Engineering um, because, and, and the whole name came about, you know, like the adversity that we mentioned before, when we mm -hmm. first started the wind tunnel, we not only were we one of the few women that was a part of the crew that worked at the wind tunnel, but we were also like the stereotypical blonde California girls who have, mm -hmm. you know, the gap, like the Valley girl accent. And, you know, we enjoy looking nice and we put effort into that. And I think that kind of puts us in a little shoebox of, well, they're not real engineers. And so yeah. we decided to name <laughs> our podcast, The Blonde Blueprint, because we want to show that not only are we true to ourselves and our true identity, but we are also uh, great engineers. And we also wanted to share with um, the engineering community community that there is a support group for other women like us and other people who are at a disadvantage in the industry so underrepresented groups and we really wanted to have like a welcoming setting and like you mentioned before um i think it goes a long way to have someone with like that diverse uh perspective to get the project yeah. right so like the person who was um bed bound they they had the unique perspective of like what would be needed to get the job done for the same mm -hmm. way that, you know, we have a unique perspective as women as to like what the problems are in the industry and what can be uh, approached better. And we try to share that with our listeners. Yeah. I think engineering specifically, you're making things for other people, right? And if only one type of person is making those things, they don't have enough experience to know how those items and objects and stuff that they're making are going to best serve everybody. So having a diverse work group in engineering is really important to make sure that the things that you are making and putting out into the world are best for the most amount of people. Yeah, and and I think that we both came from like, really sorry, we, we both came from uh, the type of background where we didn't have that kind of influence. Um, like our parents weren't in the aerospace industry. We didn't know how we wanted to get in and how we, what the best way to move around and navigate our careers is so we kind of wanted to be an example of like look at these people who had no idea what they wanted to or like how they were supposed to get to like their dream job in high school and then they navigated their way through college found themselves at engineering and then found themselves in these awesome positions and and you know wanting to share with the world how we continue that navigation and that you know showing that not everything happens exactly the way you plan and there's a lot of you know 
uh, turns in the road that you didn't expect, like COVID and stuff like that. So we're just trying to make it a really relatable podcast. Yeah. The Blonde Blueprint to Engineering. I'll put the link to that in my show notes at janejacksoncoach.com so that people can just click through and listen as well. And I highly recommend that for any women or men in STEM roles to follow this this podcast because it's fascinating some of the interviews that that you have on there and certainly you're furthering your cause and both of you are so talented in your fields and there's so much passion that I wish you every success in your careers moving forward and you know what you'll have to come back on the show when you become flight director Taylor and chief engineer Hannah uh, how exciting would that be? That would oh, be that's amazing. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, you so that. much. Thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Oh, thank, thank you. you. If you enjoyed this podcast, look for your career podcast on iTunes and leave a review. And for all the career management support you need to create your dream career, visit www the careers academy online for immediate access to how to get a job and linkedin for career success and how to write a resume online programs plus you get one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me and monthly group coaching calls the link is in the show notes it's time to take control of your career